for tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Saturday evening, May the 26th, 1990. Memorial Weekend uh, Teaching and Deliverance Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. A.R. Trotter is the minister of the evening. This morning, we had a wonderful, wonderful service of prayer. And uh, the Lord gave something to me last fall in relationship to that that I had never seen before in the Scriptures. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to... I've talked about it several times since it happened, and some of you have heard me talk about it before. I'm going to shortcut it this evening. It's a whole... In fact, that you, you could make two or three hour talks out of it, <clears throat> but I'll try and uh, get out of here before half past eight, maybe sooner. <clears throat> but I found uh, that the Lord, and I believe that he's laying that on the hearts of many, many people, and he's looking for intercessors. And this morning we had quite a service in that vein and in that realm along the line of intercession. And uh, the Lord showed me last fall that there are some things that he's looking for, and then there's some promises that belong to those who will follow that which he's looking for. So this evening I hope to encourage, with my short talk here, hope to encourage you to seek after the things that the Lord has for those who will become intercessors. Isaiah chapter 66 and... Verse 2 says, For all those things hath my hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man, woman, boy, or girl, will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Ezekiel chapter 22, 30 says, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap for me and for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Is that true today? Is the Lord looking for somebody to stand in the gap and make up the hedge? Is he able to find anybody? Or does he still say, I can find none? Can he find a few? Are you and I going to be some of those that he can find? Isaiah chapter 59, Isaiah 59, verse 15 says, Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And that's the truth in America today. Truth faileth. Judgment is against truth. The judges of the land are judging against truth. And if you stand for truth, if you stand for truth, you're a prey. The ACLU will have, get a lawsuit against you. If you, stand, if you stand for truth and for the Word of God. That's what it says right here. And he that, that stands for truth, that departeth for, for, from evil, makes himself a prey. And that's true today. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no just ju judgment in the land. And God's displeased. And he's, going to, and he's starting to do something about it. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Today, God is calling men and women and boys and girls to be intercessors for the household of faith, to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. Amen. And he says over in Ezekiel chapter 9, let's look at what God says he has for those who do that. Ezekiel chapter 9 says, He cried also in my ears with a loud voice, the Lord cried, saying, Cause them that have charge over the church to draw near, 
even every man with a destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came. Man's number has always been through the Scriptures is six. And they came from the way of the higher gate which lieth toward the north, and every man had a slaughter weapon in his hand. But one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and they went in and stood besides the brazen altar. Where did they go? They went and stood at the place of judgment, the place of God's judgment, not the place of God's love. God is mercy. God is love. But God is also the God of judgment. He says, I'm a God of war. God's a God of war. We don't understand that. We haven't been taught that. But today, the hour has come when God is is rising in the land, and, and he's taken the sword in his hand, and he's a God of war. And the glory of the God of Israel has gone up from the cherub whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's ink on by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the church, through the midst of Jerusalem, set a mark upon the foreheads of the men, the women, the boys, and the girls, that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. What's he looking for? Those who are sighing and crying for the abominations that's in the church. And he said to the others in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city of Smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. I've always been taught by in Pentecost that there, we should have a fear of the mark of the beast and of the tribulation. I find that teaching is in error. I should have no fear of the mark of the beast or of the tribulation. Because it brings God's judgment in the land, and it brings back the king to bring in the kingdom. And to those who follow after the way of the Lord, there is no fear of the mark of the beast. But you should have a godly fear that you don't have the mark of the man clothed in linen with the writer's ink on by side in your forehead. That's the mark that you should fear that you don't have. We should desire and seek after to have the mark in our forehead that God said for the man clothed in linen to go through and mark those who sigh and cry for the abominations of the household of faith. Let us be one who sighs and cries between the porch and the altar for the abominations that's in the household of faith. Then he said to, to the others, Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. Have no mercy. Is that a God of love? No mercy. That's a God of judgment. And that God is beginning to arise in the land today. But he said, Come not near any man, woman, boy, or girl, upon whom is my mark. Children of Israel, put the blood on the doorpost and the death angel passed over. Today, we're marked with the mark of the intercessor, and the judgments of God will pass over us. Or we, may, we may go through them, but God's hand of protection will be upon us, and we'll be sealed to that day. Begin at my church, at my sanctuary. And they begin with the elders and the men of authority over the denominations of the household of God. Is that what it says? Well, that's what it means. It says, and they began with the ancient men that were at the house of God. It's an awesome thing to be in a place, a position of authority today in some of the areas that the so-called church world, because they have an awful responsibility to account before God for it. And I'm afraid that a lot of them are going to be far short of what God requires of them. Help us, Lord. To fulfill the requirements that you have for every one of us. That we are not that we don't fall short of that place wherein we are called to. <clears throat> and he said unto them, Defile the house, defile my house, the temple, the church, defile it, and fill the courts with the slain. And go you forth, and they and they went forth and slew in the city or in the church. Now we're not talking about those out that, that belong to Satan. We're talking about the church of the living God here. And it came to pass while they were slaying him, and I was foot left, and I fell upon my face and cried and said, Oh, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem of the church? Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. But he does see. And I read a little statement there that not 1% of you 
heard me read. And he said unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and the house of Judah is exceeding great. What did I read? The house of Israel and the house of Judah are not the same. There are two houses in the land, the house of Judah and the house of Israel. Study it and find it for yourself. It's all through the Scriptures. Nowhere are they both the same anymore. There's two houses in the land. But tradition tells us there's only one. Study the Scriptures and see if these things be so. And behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. He finished the job. I'll make another remark along that line, which perturbs me very, very much. I hear many ministers say from the pulpit, that little Jew, Paul. Paul was not a Jew. By his own words, he says, I'm a Benjaminite of the tribe of Benjamin. And a Benjaminite is not a Jew. A Jew is the house of Judah, and Paul was not a Jew. He was a Benjaminite by his own statement, and you can read it through the Scriptures. Okay. Let's see what God says about these who, who sigh and cry for the abominations of the household of faith. What are they called? They're called the overcomers, the eagle companies, uh, uh, the Ezekiel company, the Elijah company, whatever you want to name them. They are the overcomers. Let's see what God says about the overcomers. There are eight promises to the intercessor or the overcomer. Book of Revelations, chapter 2. Who wants? Do you want the juicy rewards? They belong to the overcomer. Revelation, chapter 2. And there's a whole sermon almost in every one of these items. But we're just going to read them. And then you decide if you want to be part of it. If you want to be part of these who are the overcomer, then you become an intercessor for the household of faith and sigh and cry between the porch and the altar for the, or for the, the churches in your community, the prayer groups in your community. Hold up your pastors. Hold up the elders. Be an intercessor. Don't pay attention to what the den name on the den denominational door is. That's immaterial. Hold up the, the household of faith. Be an intercessor for the household of faith. It doesn't go by the name of the denomination or, or, or any of like that. It, it's the body of Christ, the, the living the organism of the living God. Chapter 2, verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Tonight, let us have an ear to hear what the word of the Lord is saying. To him that overcometh. Will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God? So, first of all, we will have a right to the tree of life, a legal right to it. Verse 11, number 2. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of a second death. Eternal life, no death, no second death to the overcomer. Number 3, verse 17. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone, which in the stone is a new name written, which no man knoweth, saveth he that receiveth it. God says that he'll give us a hidden manna to eat, and then he will give us a new name, which he will give to us. Number 4, verse 25, verse 26. <clears throat> and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. What will he give? To rule and reign over the nations. What do you have to do? Keep the works of the Word of the living God. Hide it in your heart and make it a rea living reality to you. To keep the Word of the living God. Uh, that's number four. Number five is verse five of chapter three. Verse five, number five. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Hallelujah. We will be honored and recognized before the angels and before the living God. By who? Our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus. He will confess us before the Lord. Does it pay to be an intercessor? Will it pay to be an intercessor? Make it the cry of your heart. Uh, verse 12, number 6. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem which cometh down out of heaven and from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. 
What are you going to be? What is a pillar? A pillar is something that holds up the building. So he's going to make us a pillar to hold up the temple of the living God. What a privilege. What an honor to be part, to hold up the temple of the living God. Number 7, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also have overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. Equal rulership with Jesus. Sit in the throne with the Lord Jesus. What an honor. Undeserving. But if we will desire and become intercessors and sigh and cry for the abominations of the household of faith, God says that he'll mark us and consider us that we become an overcomer and the promises are to the overcomer. There are eight promises. We've read seven. There are eight. Fullness to fullness. Number eight, you'll find in chapter 21. Chapter 21, verse 7. The eighth promise. To him that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Talk about sonship. Teach it any way you like. There's the fullness of it right there. There's sonship. In the fullness. To him that overcometh. Shall, he shall inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Verse 13, chapter 22 says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do my commandments. What is the requirement? To keep and hide the word of the Lord in our hearts and do his commandments. Brother and Sister Trotter, the rest of the evening is yours. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me holy? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Aren't you glad you're saved tonight and a child of God inside the family and the kingdom and here at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp? I'd rather be here than the best penitentiary in the state of Arkansas. Hallelujah. Now, you can backslide right off the seat of a camp meeting or a church or a crusade meeting, but it's a pretty good place to get to God where people have come together to seek the face of the living God. Haven't we had a wonderful time of the Lord? Wonderful time. Now, we just didn't come to have a time. We came to get something. But as an added blessing, the Lord gives us a time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, the, the prophet of God and the... I think we've had the entire five-fold ministry here in the camp meeting this week. Hallelujah! Brother Johnson is certainly gifted of God to expound the Word of God. Brother and Sister Moody with a detailed, researched, anointed ministry of setting people free and getting them delivered from every demonic force and power of darkness and hell. Brother and Sister Miller raised up of God, Sister Souter leading, and this other lady, I'm half deaf, I didn't get, not a demon of deafness, just shouting for 37 years at the top of my lungs. I, I dull the sensitivity of my ears on the outside. What is your name? Ministering and hearing music and, and singing. And I, I thank God that we don't have to go back to 1914 or 1978. But right now in 1990, people are still sensitive and moving with the flow of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No big eyes or little U's or smart alecks in the kingdom of God. That's right. Blessed be the name of our God. We're not interested in a display of talent. Incidentally, the talent has been excellent. This beautiful young lady and her dedicated, sanctified violin has ministered to us and these two red-headed evangelists tonight and their guitars and singing for the glory of God. We enjoyed it. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! You don't have to go to some rock concert or sit home and look at Midnight Special. You can come out to Lake Hamilton Bible Camp and get all the blessing and the music you need. Amen! 
Glory to God. Sister Trotter is very reluctant to do so, but somebody here was saying wise. I think it was Sister uh, Erlene was saying you're supposed to be submissive and obedient. Or at least he was saying it. Somebody was saying it. I picked up on it. And uh, different ones have said, would you please have Sister Vivian uh, play a piano solo? We're not interested in the display of talent. We're doing it for the magnification and the glorification of Almighty God. But you asked. And I have insisted, so she's being obedient, so that ought to have the anointing on it. Hallelujah! What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Glory to God, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Mm, that's a little high. Drop it a little bit for me, please. Spirit of the 
crucified my Savior and laid him in the tomb. They crucified my Savior and laid him in the tomb. They crucified my Savior and laid him in the tomb. And the Lord can take the spirit home. He rose, he rose, he rose from the grave. He rose, he rose, he rose from the grave. He rose, he rose, he rose from the grave. And the Lord can take the spirit home. Well, an angel came from heaven and he rolled the stone away. Well, an angel came from heaven, and he rolled the stone away. Well, an angel came from heaven, and he rolled the stone away. And the Lord can take the spirit home. He rose, he rose, he rose up from the grave. He rose, thank God, he rose, thank God. He rose up from the grave. He rose, he rose, he rose from the grave, and the Lord conveyed his spirit home. Well, the soldiers fell at dead men, prostrate on the ground. Well, the soldiers fell as dead men, prostrate on the ground. Well, the angels fell like dead men, prostrate on the ground, and the Lord conveyed. of the already purchased possession of which we now have an inheritance and of which we shall receive the final full uh, fruition of it and manifestation of it. But thank God I don't have to go to bed tonight wondering, oh God, am I saved? And I don't have to get up in the morning saying, am I saved? I know in whom I have believed it. I am persuaded that that which I have committed to His trust, uh, He'll keep it for me against that day. Hallelujah. Well, hallelujah. 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 To the Lamb, my sins are all forgiven. I'm saved and no I. And we'll be over on the mountain just about the break of day. Down came a shining angel, and he rode 
just on the way. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lamb. My sins are all forgiven. I'm saved and I know I am. Glory, hallelujah. Well, sometimes I'm on the mountain. How many thank God for the mountaintop experiences? Had an old boy came to my church in Denver. He said, Brother Trotter, ever since I've been saved, I've always had a mountaintop of experience. I've either been on the mountaintop or the mountain's been on top of me. <laughs> ah, yes. But sometimes I'm on the mountain. But sometimes... Now, come on, we don't... Is this an honest... I haven't heard too much about positive confession around here this week. If you're positive confession, people, don't you get mad at me. But we can go around saying it's not right for us to admit that sometimes... I'm way down low, but God knows it's the truth. i got to get a 30-foot extension ladder to crawl up and touch bottom. But I hear my Savior calling, and my Savior's voice I know. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb. My sins, do you hear that, devil? My sins are all forgiven. I'm saved, whether I feel like it all the time or not, I'm saved. And I know a knowledge born of the Holy Ghost within me for His Spirit. My spirit bears witness of his spirit that I have passed from death into life and I'm a child of God. I'm saved and I know I am. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Oh, glory to the Father. Glory, glory to the Son. The Holy Spirit, glory to the three in one. Well, some folks say that John the Baptist, he was not, I don't know what tribe he is out of, and I hope this doesn't make you mad, but he was nothing but a Jew. But my good old Bible tells me that he had the Holy Ghost too. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah to the land down by the river Jordan where John Baptized the Lamb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus said, You go, I'll go with you. Preach the gospel, and I'll preach with you. Lord, if I go, tell me what to say. And the world will be. And me, they cast Brother Daniel into the lion's den, cause he would never honor man. They will cast Jonah on the sand of the sea. It brought apart a lesson to you and me. Jesus said, if you go, I'll go with you. Preach the gospel and I'll preach with you. Lord, and if I go, tell me what to say. That the world will believe on me. Holiness is God's command. Oh, the God's son. Changing hands, troubles may rise, sin may roll, but 
Christ will save your sinful soul. Jesus said, if you go, I'll go with you. Preach the gospel, and I'll preach with you. Lord, if I go, tell me what to say. Tell the world will believe on me. Well, I looked at my hands. They were new. I looked at my feet, and they were too. The word of God sounded so sweet. Well, the love ran down to the soles of my feet, and Jesus said, "If you go, I'll go with you." The gospel, and I'll preach with you, Lord. If I go, tell me what to say. Tell the world won't believe on me. What here we are? Well, one day I was walking. One day I was talking. One day I was living. Deep in sin, oh yes. Well, I wouldn't believe it, and I couldn't receive it. Well, I never knew I needed such a friend. Oh yes. Well, I started seeking. And I started searching. I was looking for that man from Galilee. Oh yes, hear the words I'm saying. Well, to him I'm praying. Come on down from glory. Set your child free. Oh yes. Well, well. He put running in my feet. He put collapsing in my head. He put doubting from my mind. He put shouting in my heart. Oh, God, brighter. Brighter. Oh, God, brighter. I started walking. Walking. I started talking. Talking. I started singing. Come on, shouting. God said. God said. God said that he would consider. God said, God said that he would deliver. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All day long, everybody, where you really should have been there when he set me free. can remember when Jesus set you free, washed in the blood. How many on your way to Father's house? On your way to Father's house, glory to God. Well, I'm on my way up there. To my Father's house, to my Father's house, hallelujah, to my Father's house, thank God on my way up there. To my Father's house, there they Just take the hand of the person alongside of you, if you will, please. And agree together with me. We've heard enough gospel around this camp tabernacle today to save the United States of America. That's truth. We've heard teaching. We've been delivered. Our brother prayed under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Sister Trotter and I agreed together in prayer while he was praying. Brother Miller, he is praying this afternoon, and we were believing God to bind every satanic force, not only in our own lives, but some lives of some other people we knew, and we felt anointed of God to do it, and we're claiming victory. Let me tell you, we've not been here putting on little third-rate entertainment. We've been doing business for Jesus and doing business for God in this camp. Hallelujah! And I feel God has yet something He'd like to do tonight. We're not interested in what man has to say, but we are interested in what the Holy Ghost has to say. Will you pray earnestly, out loud, reverently, but earnestly with me right now that God will cover us with the blood and hide us behind the cross and fill us with His Spirit. Our Father and our God, we thank Thee for this camp. We thank Thee for every man, woman, boy, and girl in this church house tonight. My God, I thank You for the speakers and the leaders and the prophets and the apostles and the evangelists and the pastors. 
pastors and the teachers uh, and those with a ministry of helps. Uh, my God, I pray that right now that you will anoint lips of clay. Uh, give us the, uh, the tongue as of a pen of a ready writer. Uh, let us speak as the very silver tongued oracles of God. Uh, and, O oh Lord, I pray that ere the last amen is heard in this tabernacle tonight, that there will be a mighty deliverance. Uh, there will be no sick person leave unwell. Uh, there will be no bound person leave still in bondage. Uh, there will be no person that is here with a hunger or thirst that shall not be filled and satisfied uh, at Father's table. And we'll thank you for it for your name's sake. We ask it. And everybody said, uh, Amen. Now, after looking at that table back there, over here to the side, and looking at the tremendous array of tapes, and after we've had enough demons cast out and every sickness, and uh, Sister Miller was talking about there was something she thought he missed, and he hollered out, no, I covered it all. <laughs> Praise God. And he wasn't being smart. He had. He felt that God had anointed him, and, and it seems like almost carrying coals to Newcastle to speak on this. And so I went over to the room after supper and said, Oh, God, they've had enough deliverance priests to deliver America for the next 40 years. Are you sure you want me to preach on this? No, I'm not being smart. I didn't hear his audible voice, but you know what I mean when I say the voice of God spoke to me. Now, sometimes, only on two occasions in my life have I ever heard what I thought was the audible voice of God. One time was in the Garden of the Resurrection outside the old walled city of Jerusalem. And I had my tape recorder on because I was giving running notes on what I was saying. I had paid the Arab Christian, Arab Christian, that runs the thing. I'd given him $25 or $50. I forget what I gave him, but to have my little 12 minutes by myself... You know, otherwise they're touring groups and tourists, the crowd in there all the time. But I paid him some money to keep them out. Let me have a few minutes by myself. And so I was in by the Garden of the Resurrection at the foot of Gordon's Calvary, or right by the side of, not at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, but at the Gordon's Calvary, the place of the skull. And I, I was there, and I said, if they have actually, if this is it, if, if, and if this is the excavation down to the level at about the time that Jesus was here on earth, this must have been about where Mary stood on the resurrection morning and said, Oh, sir, seeing one whom she thought was the gardener, and saying, Please tell me where you have taken him, that I might go and take him again. And then Jesus turned to her and said, Mary. And instantly there was something about that voice that caused her to fall at his feet. And she said, and he said, now look, wait a minute, wait, hey, hey, wait a minute. You don't need to hang on to me. Handle me not. Touch me not. It didn't mean I'm untouchable. I mean, you don't have to hold on to me like grim death. Now, I've not yet ascended to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. And what he was actually saw, so that's another sermon in itself. But what he was actually saying was, look, Mary, I know that we've had the pain and the grief of separation. And I know you've cried your eyes out and you've not been able to sleep since Calvary. For you thought that all the hopes and aspirations of the Messiah and the hope of the Messiah were dashed. And I know that you're afraid now if you, if you let go of me, there'll be another time of separation. But I'm telling you, Mary, you don't have to hang on to me. Because never, 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 ever, never, there's never going to be a separation again. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! That's a different sermon. But I was right there, and I, I didn't have a vision of him, but I thought I heard him call my name. And it so thrilled me, I tore out of the place back to my hotel, and I said, I'm the first one in history that's got the voice of God on tape. I've got it right here, because I had my tape recorder running. Brother Johnson, I know what it is to have him speak in here, and I know what it is to have him speak in my inner ear, but it didn't sound like my inner ear. It sounded like my outer ear. But I got home and played it back to the hotel room, played the tape, and there was a blank spot. So it was, I was not hallucinating. Don't you blaspheme and say I was hallucinating. My ear was so attuned to heaven that I heard one of the two times of my life the audible voice of God as he called my name and spoke to me. I didn't have that over in the room, but I did have the impression of the Holy Ghost. You go ahead and preach what I laid on your heart to preach. There's going to be somebody there that needs it. So here goes. Glory to God. 
hell, I feel like an old... Uh, you say, old-fashioned, we're not old, we're up to date. Yeah, I'm not trying to drag you into the dim, distant mists of antiquity. I'm just here to tell you, this is not a foreign spirit, and this is not an oddball, offshoe spirit. This is the same identical flow of the Holy Ghost you can trace right back to the upper room on the day of Pentecost. Amen! Hallelujah! All right. Three steps in getting things from God. Whether it's healing, or the salvation of your loved ones, or deliverance from habits, or, or money that is sanctified according to the will of God. I'm not talking about selfish gain. Got an awful lot of preaching and teaching going around the country. Thank God I've not even smelled the remnants of it around here this week. And if I have, I've confused the odor, and I didn't recognize it. So if I'm tromping on toes, I feel like Brother Jack did last night. We, have, we reserve the right to disagree, and after you've heard me out and studied the Scriptures, if you still disagree, you have a perfect right to be wrong. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> ah, glory to God. But uh, a lot of people go around preaching prosperity as though it were some kind of a gumball machine or a candy bar machine. That all you do is put your two quarters in the slot and pull the handle, and God somehow is under obligation to make you the president day of the company and make you filthy rich. We don't pay our tithes to get money. We don't give to the kingdom of God. We don't give to Lake Hamilton Bible Camp so that we can get rich. We give because He's already saved us and already redeemed us and already washed us in His blood. Oh, will God delight to prosper you? He'll prosper you as much as you can stand and still stay saved. That's right. Evidently, I can't stand very much because he's never seemed to give me very much. My wife has said half-jokingly, Honey, you preached poverty for 35 years, and now thank God we're enjoying it. Hallelujah. And so I... Uh, I understand that, and I believe it's God's will that you should prosper. You quit running around on your wife and quit smoking crack and quit drinking booze and give eight hours work for eight hours pay and keep your nose clean and your powder dry and serve God and pay your tithes, and God will promote you and God will bless you. But you don't give to God or the evangelist or the Bible camp or the preacher to get back. You give because he gave his son to hang on the spikes of Calvary for your eternal salvation. Amen! Hallelujah! Glory to God in the land forever. But getting things from God, whether it is finance or whatever your thing is, healing for the body, the mind, the soul, I'm going to approach it from just a little different angle tonight. Uh, but it's all, I don't think I'm in any conflict, because I feel charged of the Holy Spirit to go ahead. There are three steps. Now, under any one of these three steps, you could literally put as many, without exaggeration, as many as 15 or 20 subparagraphs that could come under the three broad general steps in getting things from God. And you might have to reach a little bit to get them under one of the three, but I believe these are the three irreducible minimum steps in approaching God and asking God and getting things from God. It is not a roll or twist of the roulette wheel. Amen. It is not a flip of the coin. It is not as the cookie crumbles or the mop flops or the ball bounces. It is not that kind of thing at all. My brother, sister, there are some Bible, scriptural, sound grounds uh, upon which we can approach the throne of God Almighty's grace, and we can know that He will hear us when we pray. And whatsoever thing we have desired of Him, it shall be granted unto us. Now, the first thing, and I have, I'm not a novice. I was born and raised in this. That's not any real criteria of authenticity. I know a lot of old folks that are crazy as hoot owls. So, I mean, I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not claiming that, uh, that the uh, veneration of age gives me any particular upsmanship on anybody else. But I have been around this thing all my life, and I have devoted my life to the study of the Word of God, and I'm, I'm confident that I can declare this without fear of successful contradiction, that one of the prime requisites in getting things from God is, first of all, to make things right with God. 
And I'd like to read you two verses of Scripture found in the book of Psalms 139, the 23rd and the 24th verses. The 23rd and the 24th verses of the 139th Psalm. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and that's not just enough for him to search me and know my heart. He adds more to it and says, try me, put me under the spotlight and know the very thoughts of my heart, because out of the abundance of the heart, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now, but you confess with the teeth out. No man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. So all we have to do is say, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, and that's the Holy Ghost. That's a Paul parrot. That's not the Holy Ghost. What about somebody that is dumb and can't speak, and they had their fingers cut off, and they can't even give the sign language? Well, it's not saying it with your teeth. It's not verbal. I know I know all about a rhema, and I know all about verbalizing, and I know all about the Lord God inhabiteth with the praises of His people. I've got series of sermons on the subject. But I'm talking tonight, I'm not talking about verbalizing something, because you can do that. Voltaire knew the entirety of the French Bible. Bob Ingersoll could quote Isaiah and Jeremiah and the entire Pentateuch and all the Pauline epistles, and he died and went straight to hell. Merely being able to Paul parrot the phraseology, my faith is power, my faith is power. It is more than being able to articulate, it is to have it down on the inside. Amen. Search my heart, know my thoughts, O oh God, and see if there is what? If there is any wicked way in me, and then do what? Just condemn me to the pits of the fiery flames forever? No, lead me. Oh, hallelujah. Lead me in the way everlasting. Glory to God and the Lamb forever. Now, most of us, no, I shouldn't say of us, this is rhetorical tonight. I don't know you. My uncle, uh, one of my uncles, my mother's youngest brother, who just recently went home to be with the Lord, he used to say, I'm not preaching to the person that stayed home. I'm not talking to the guy sitting in front of you or the mother in back of you with the baby in her arms, mister. I'm talking to you. Well, I'm not quite that brave. Some of you look bigger than me. <laughs> and so I'm going to behave myself tonight. But really, a lot of people today, they want to approach God trying to sort of give him a snow job. They want to tell God how good they are and how wonderful they are and, and how, how just they have done the best they possibly know how. And like Hezekiah, say, oh, Lord, you know I paid my tithes uh, and I've, I've kept all the law from my youth up and I've done everything in my power. And there, I guess there's nothing wrong with that. But my brother, sister, dear, we don't get things from God and get into a proper rapport and relationship with God by trying to pull the wool over his eyes. By putting our best foot forward, we get things from God by absolutely scraping clean, honest to God down to the bone and laying it out upon the altar. Now, I haven't had a chance to read your whole manual, but if I picked up anything the other day and just skimming through the manual, which is no way to really understand your train of thought, but if I understand anything at all, this man and his wife, they believe in not playing games. You don't get things from God by trying to pretend that you are something that you are not. Now, you might fool the preacher, and you'd be surprised how little you really do fool the preacher. And you might try to fool your wife or your husband or your Sunday school teacher, but, brother, you're not fooling God, and you're sure not fooling the devil, and if you're absolutely honest, you're not even really fooling yourself. We need to make things right with God. For don't, don't try... Now, when I was courting this lady who is currently my wife. I, yeah, she's not only my first wife, she's my last wife. I said, till death do us part. She said, you ever cheat on me, you're dead. <laughs> That's right. You think I'm kidding, don't you? All I know is before we were married, she said, listen up. She said, you ever mess around with another woman, I'll wait until you go to sleep and I'll operate on you with a butcher knife. And you'll never be interested in messing with another woman. I don't know exactly what she meant, mister, but I'm not about to find out, I'll tell you that. And that little German girl would do it, don't you think she wouldn't? Glory to God. Well, when I was courting her, I was preaching meetings up here in North Upper on Moralton and, and uh, West Memphis and... And uh, Baytown, you know where Bay, I mean Bay Village is? 
up by Cherry Valley. Back then, it was 18 miles on gravel. The only thing that was there was a feed store and the little local Pentecostal church. And they knifed somebody to death the Friday night before I started my meeting on Sunday, and we had a deputy sitting out there in the services to keep peace among the saints. Well, I had a revival, and that was some revival. I, I held it. Didn't go to No, we did. We had a good meeting. Those people came out of the plantation country like jackrabbits. I'm talking 38 years ago, and we had a meeting. People got saved and got the baptism of the Holy Ghost and were set free and delivered, and we had a wonderful time. Hallelujah! But I'd get in the car and drive, no freeways back then, drive like a bat out of Carlsbad to get back down to North Texas where my wife was. I'd leave after service on Sunday night, and I would drive all Sunday night, all Monday, come 8 or 9 or nine o'clock Monday night. I would be topping the hill over Burke Burnett coming down my Camp Shepherd, see the lights of all the way from way out at, ha at Electra, clear over to Holiday, spread out over about 20 miles of territory there. I want you to know something, mister. I was on my way to my beloved. I didn't pull off to a pullout and go to sleep. I put the pedal to the metal uh, and got blood and lead poisoning in my big toe, stuck it right up in the carburetor. I go sliding into Wichita Falls, knew all the shortcuts, come down the Jacksboro cutoff, cut up into Jasper Street and around the gravel road, slide up along the side of that bush outside of her house, jump the hedge, run up to the door, knock on the door, she'd open the door, and then we'd, none of your business what we did. <laughs> ah, yeah. But I didn't tell her about the little one-legged churches where you had to sleep on an army cot in the back of the platform. I didn't tell her all about the times I didn't get enough money in my offering to get out of town. I told her about the big churches, and I told her about the powerful meetings, and what a great evangelist I was. And I was going to be the Pentecostal Billy Graham. I was going to set them of America and the world on its ear. And the poor girl, she believed me. That's right. I gave her my best. Now, I'm, I'm being a little facetious. It's getting late, and I'm trying to keep you awake. But I've got a serious thought here, and the serious thought is that some of us come to God just that way. We think somehow we can fool God into how holy we are. And we can fool God, uh, and oh, oh, Lord, I was in there. And when they were singing Amazing Grace, well, I felt the doodaddies go all over me. And when they were singing uh, Power in the Blood, I even was able to work up a tear. And on Mother's Day, when they were singing Tell Mother I'll Be There in answer to her prayer, I had, a, I had a lump in my throat the size of a cantaloupe. And Lord, you know, really, I'm very tender, and I'm very emotional towards the things of God. Now, I'm not making fun of that. You can tell the way I worship. And the way we sing, and I've been bawling up here half the camp meeting, just getting a big blessing. I'm not making fun of that. But I'm telling you, I'm not fooling God one little smidgen either. He knows exactly my daily life and my daily walk, and He knows the desires of the heart uh, and the intents and the thoughts of the life and the intents of the mind. And God wants us to quit playing games uh, and have nickel and dime religion, and He wants us to scrape down uh, and make things right with God. Uh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I have a double cousin that is a teacher at Christ for the Nations Institute in Dallas. And when he was a little boy, he did not like to eat the crust from a piece of bread. Of course, a lot of the bread was home-baked bread. You didn't get store-bought bread. You had home-baked bread. And my aunt never, her long suit was preaching, not baking bread. And I'll admit that sometimes you needed a hacksaw to get through the crust. She's still alive. Don't anybody tell her that if she ever comes around. But, but really, I can understand why he didn't like the crust. But she was of the old school. Kids sat up and ate what was set before them, or they did without. And she looked at him and said, John, you don't get anything else, or you don't leave the table until you eat the crust of the bread. Well, it didn't take him long to discover that when she became preoccupied or as a pastor's wife had to get up and go answer the phone, that he could take that crust and put it in his pocket. And then he would, she'd come back and go, oh, good boy, you ate all your... Yeah, I ate all my crust. Well, they, they were poor as Job's turkey, returned missionaries from West Africa, and they were pastoring in Colorado Springs, and in the dining room, they didn't have any dining room furniture. But they had an old upright piano, a lot taller. You know, the old ones were a lot bigger than this one's been cut down, or this is a smaller upright. But the big old uprights, and she had it caddy corner. Is that Arkansas? Do you understand what I mean by caddy corner? Across the end, you know, and the, 
that in, sat this way across the, the, the dining room. And they did the old thing. It was supposed to have casters on it so the women could pull it out and sweep behind the, the piano and then push it back. But the casters had long since, fall, since fallen off of somebody's barn or someplace and was long gone. And she didn't move that thing for the four and a half years they pastored that church. She said when they took a church in Topeka, Kansas, and the men of the Kansas church came up to move them, they moved that piano out, uh, and brother, from the floor to two feet up the wall uh, was a stack of bread crusts. Because as he'd get up and leave the kitchen table, he'd go by that piano, and he'd reach in his pocket and fire the old bread crust uh, in back of the piano. I declare unto you that there are saints of God, surely not at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp tonight, but I've heard tell on to him uh, that there are saints of God that have got a two-foot stack of stuff behind the piano somewhere, and they think God Almighty doesn't know it. They think God Almighty doesn't see it. I want you to know tonight, while we cannot earn our salvation, we can I cannot do enough good works. I cannot clean myself up enough to be worthy of His so marvelous free gift of grace. I want you to know that once you are saved, God wants you to quit playing around and playing games and get down to business and clean up your life and bring yourself into conformity with this blessed old black back book and get your act together that we can begin to ask God and believe that God's going to answer our prayer. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Did you know that sometimes the heathen know a lot more than we do? How long can I go tonight? Seriously, this is Saturday night. Do they all have to drive home for Sunday service? Ushers lock the doors. You know, I, I wonder, you know, the hour went by so quickly when Brother Harris was preaching, Brother Johnson preaching, our brother and sister, their hour went by so quickly, sister, this afternoon. Sister Trotter says, if you keep that up, nobody will ever invite you back anywhere. My hours don't seem to go by quickly. They go by very long, but I, they, they don't for me. They go by quick for me. <laughs> Praise God. But I was in West Africa a number of years ago at a leprosorium in New Hope Town in Liberia, West Africa. And it, we, we had a 16 weeks revival. I was not the only preacher. There's five or six missionaries and missionary evangelists that were there. But when my turn came, I was a boy preacher, and when my turn came, we went at it like we were killing snakes. And thank God, the Africans didn't have any television to look at, didn't have any radio to go home and listen to, didn't have any movies to go to. They were poor as Job's turkey. You know how poor Job's turkey is. He's so poor he can't even lean up against the barn and gobble. <laughs> and uh, and they, they, were, they were really poor. And so they would sit there, one hour, two hours, one day, no, no be all day, which you know fit to do today, you fit to do tomorrow, and they didn't get in any big hurry. And so, during the, this, this was my chance to preach. And you had to pass word to two or three different people because it was a leprosorium that had been established by the missions board and by the particular group with which I was associated at the time. And people came in from hundreds and hundreds, even a thousand or more miles away, and crossing dialect and language lines. So we had a number, we had numerous languages represented, and so we passed word. If you've ever preached with an interrupter, I mean an interpreter, you know, if, if, you, if you preach a 15-minute sermon and it's passed once, well, then that's a half-hour sermon. And if it's passed twice, that's a 45-minute sermon. And if it's passed three times, that's an hour sermon. Just preaching 15 minutes takes an hour. And I've never been known to preach 15 minutes in my life. And, uh, and we, we were preaching and having a great time. And with all of that was going on, about 500 jammed into the little thatch roof, mud-walled, bamboo-seated chapel that night. People with their ears gone, nose gone, fingers gone, toes gone. So I'd seen some with gaping holes in their side where you could look down into the viscera. And, of course, when they'd reach a vital artery or a... Or a uh, vain, reach a vital part, they die. I was called off a platform on three occasions in that 16-week revival to go and pray with one, two heathen and one Christian that was dying and going into eternity, went to talk to the heathen to give them one last chance to get saved, went to encourage the child of God that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Oh, hallelujah! For all oh, glory to God. Well, anyway, we were there in that meeting. But this night, back here on my right, be your left, back on my right, about back where the brother with the yellow shirt sitting, there was an old lady. 
We call them witch doctor. They're not witches. They think they are priestesses of their heathen society. We call them a witch doctor, or a, 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 but they don't call themselves that. That's, the heath, that's what they are. And they, they practice witchcraft and black magic and so on. That's why we call that, but they don't call themselves that. And they were, there was several hubbub going on around her. So I turned to John Gua, the black pastor, and I said, John, please go back and stop it. It was very distracting. It's hard to keep your thought while you're waiting for the interpreter to say your sentence anyway. And it was doubly hard having this boop, 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 going on back here in the back. So I said, go back and stop that. He came back and said, oh, I think this is a kick. This is a guy 30 years old, and I was younger than he was, and he called me Pa, because that was a term of endearment and respect. You know, they have pa. he said, Pa, he said, you, you don't want to stop that one. I said, why, John? He said, why, she has come down for treatment. She's got leprosy, and she has come down from so far back in French country that nobody here knows her language. And they're having to pass it through three or four before they can even get it to her. And so they're, they're articulating. Well, you know how you lose much when it's just translated once. You can imagine the pitiful little amount she was getting after translated the third or fourth time. But I said, I'll let it go. What difference does it make? And I went back to talk to her after the service that night. I had to talk to an interpreter. And I talked to her and I tried to tell her the simple story of salvation. There is a God, the big God, the unknown God, the invisible God, the God who made everything. No, not the God of the alligator. No, not the God of the chimpanzee. No, not the God of the tree. No, not the God of the cow manure. No, not the fertility God. No, not the male sex principle. No, not the female sex principle. No, not those gods or goddesses. Not the queen society. Not the water leopard society. But the great God. Oh, yes, the great God. I said, did you know that he loved you enough? that he sent his only begotten son uh, to die for you. And I tried not to use a lot of theological jargon that she'd have no idea what I was talking about. And the blackness and the dullness of the night of hell shone in that woman's eyes. One or two little snaggle teeth in the old crone's face. And they, she turned and through the interpreter to come back and said, I hear your story. It is very interesting. But it could not apply to me. And I said, why? She said, because I have eaten of the flesh of more people than I can count. Not for hunger, but for ceremonial purposes. Because she, you know, the girls over there, not so much now, a little bit back in the interior, but back then, they'd be sold as a wife when they were 12 or 13 years of age, begin to bear children and have one every 10 or 11 months until they either died of blood poisoning or their bodies were so depleted and burned out. A woman lived past 35 years of age, they venerated her. And they made her a high priestess. They made her a priestess. And she became the, a powerful judge over her whole tribe. Way back, several hundred, way back northeast of Chian, way back in French country. And, and she said what, I, what they would do is they would judge. It's supposed to all be the gods, but what actually happened, she would judge whether the person was guilty or innocent. And how you could tell whether the person was guilty or innocent is she would brew up a little pottage or a little brew and make them drink it. And if they were innocent, of course, they could drink it and they'd be all right. And if they were guilty, they'd take two steps and drop dead. Well, to prove that it was really magic or really spiritual powers rather than poisons, the exotic poisons that many of them have, then she would have to eat part of the flesh of the body because the average uneducated, you know, the blacks aren't stupid, they were just uneducated. And for the uneducated black in that particular tribe, they said that if it was poison, then if she ate some of it, she would also die of the poison. They didn't know that some poisons only go to the brain and the medulla and the neurological centers and don't get into the flesh. They are not hematological. They are neurological. You understand neurological. You understand what I'm saying? And so they would, she would eat. And she said, I have eaten of the flesh of more people, and your God cannot save me. Make a long story longer. I went home that night, burdened for that woman. It was my brother's and my turn to have the 6 o'clock service. Back in those days, I could get up at that time, Doc. Now, the, the Spirit's willing, and my wife is weak. I mean, my flesh is weak. <laughs> I'm not able to make it when I'd like to. But I, I got up. Stayed up, prayed half the night, got up with my brother, walked three and a half miles back through the jungle, went over to the commissary where we had a little devotional before they began to dispense shots of shalmugra oil. They've improved the treatment in more recent years. They're trying to help and do what you can, bind up the ulcerated sores and, and do what you can to alleviate the suffering. And there was a bonfire in the door of the chapel. 
And John Gua was there, and I said, look, Gua, if they're going to build the fire, it's not that cold, for one thing. And I said, what, what do you, you know, 80 degrees, but after you've had 110 degrees, 80 degrees feels a little chilly. And so I said, it's not that cold, for one thing. But furthermore, they'll walk through the ashes and track it in, and they, they get all messed up. But, but he said, no, 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 you don't understand. He said, remember that woman you were talking with last night? Yes. He said, well, she couldn't go to sleep either. And about three or four o'clock this morning, she got up and she came to my house and she borrowed a file. And she sat down and began to file off all of the brass bracelets, which all have a religious and a symbolic meaning, and began to take off all of the fetish and all of the juju and all of the charm and all of the leopard's teeth and shaved her head, got some hot water and a sharp knife and all of the corn road hair matted with cow manure, which had symbolic meaning under the heathen deity. She wanted to shave her head clean. And she came and said, can I make a bonfire of it? Because I believe what that young white preacher said. And I'm going to come and give myself to that God. And I don't want to bring any of the old thing along with me. I'm going to burn it up. And I'm going to come to Him. Now I understand just as I am without one plea. You don't make yourself perfect and then come to be saved. The point of my little illustration is, after you are saved, let's quit trying to drag along. That old woman had a marvelous... Can I tell the rest of the story? I know it's like... Can I tell the rest of it? Pretend I've been at FBGMFI banquet. Hallelujah. They go on forever. Glory to God. Let me tell you, three nights later, it wasn't my turn to preach. But I, we weren't supposed to lay hands on the, on the lepers. We weren't, because it takes ten years sometimes for that thing to incubate. And they said, do not. And then you had to wash and face the hex and, and so on afterwards. But let me tell you, what Pentecostal child of God can keep your hands off a seeker when they're up there trying to get something from God? It's like a magnet and steel filings. I just want to get down and get my head on their wool and give them a good Pentecostal Dutch rub. Hallelujah. And shake them good and pray with them and give them a good Pentecostal spit bath. Glory to God. Praise Him, sister. Praise Him. You know. I was walking up and down with the seekers, little humble, little humble. It was nothing pretentious at all. Little humble thing. Two Coleman gasoline pump-up lanterns hung on a post holding up the roof. Just several hundreds of people, dozens of people seeking God. John Gore, one of the other priests, said, oh, you must come quick. I said, what is it? He said, you must come quick and hear her speak in God's country mouth. I said, God's country mouth? Oh, yes, God's, God's country mouth. You must come and hear her speak. And I expected to hear her speaking in some language that I wouldn't have recognized it anyway. I didn't. I did get so I could say, hello, awio, mugiao, atalo. I mean, I could say, good morning, how are you? How's your father? How's your grandfather? Where's the restroom? You know, I mean, I, I learned a, a few of the, of the phrases in, in some of the dialects in West Africa, but I didn't understand her language at all. But I went up. Now, I tell you the truth and why not. That woman was kneeling there with her hands straight up her heaven. She couldn't talk English. And when she did learn a few weeks later, it was such pidgin English with a heavy African accent. Why, her English, you had to listen four times to understand what she was trying to say. She was kneeling there, brother, articulating in perfect accentless English. It was not British English. It was not American English. It was more like American television announcer English. It was not from the deep south, nor was it from New York or, or, or Boston. or It was not an accent anywhere, or Georgia. I mean, there was no accent. It was a perfect accentless English. And you said, what was she saying? She was saying, Jesus, I love you. I thank you for dying on Calvary for me. I thank you for the cleansing of the blood. I thank you for coming out of the grave for me and kept it up. And when the Spirit of God lifted from her, she couldn't even say good night until they taught her several weeks later to say, how are you, good morning, uh, and good night, and goodbye, and the simple phrases in, in English. Oh, my brother, sister, dear, uh, let me tell you that the heathen sometimes have more sense than we do in the United States of America. We think we can bring the old baggage and the old garbage and the old filth right along with us, and we're always at, Brother Trotter, how many cigarettes do I have to smoke before I'm backslid? Was it you talking? Yeah, it was you. And, and I understood what you were saying. No quarrel between you and me. I think you're hot stuff. <laughs> but he was saying, true at another point, that he, if so be, in this freedom we have in God, I could go into a bar and drink a can of beer. I don't know whether I'm an alcoholic or not. I'm afraid to find out. 
I'll tell you this, if I thought I was and God delivered me, I wouldn't go around tempting God. I wouldn't even gargle with Listerine. Amen. I stay as far away from alcohol as I could possibly get. Some character going around the country, maybe you had him preach for you here, that's saying if God really delivers you from the demon of alcoholism, well, you can have a, 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 an aperitif before dinner, and, and you can have a wine with dinner, and a brandy or two afterwards, and if you're really delivered, you'll never be an alcoholic. Let me tell you, God ever deliver me from that devilish swirl, I want to stay as far away from it as I possibly can. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! People know how many can't... Oh, I'm glad. But he is. He's floating around in charismatic circles. Bless his heart. I'm not criticized. I don't want to, I just felt a foreign spirit be introduced. I don't want it to be a foreign spirit. I'm here to tell you the question is not how many cans of beer can you drink and still stay saved. It's not how many packs of cigarette or how many pounds of Star Navy you can chew and still stay saved. It's not how many dirty jokes you can tell and laugh at and still stay saved or how many X-rated films on HBO you can look at and still stay saved. The question, Brother Miller, is not how close to the world can I walk and still stay saved and under the grace of God. God, the question is how far away from the beggarly elements of Babylon can I get? And how close to the wounded, bleeding side of the Son of God can I walk? Hallelujah! 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 Search my, search my heart, oh God. Search my heart. Search my heart. Paul said, I fear, lest in striving to save others, that I myself become refuse on the, on the dung heap of the world of God, and I myself be cast away of God. I don't want to just barely make it in by the skin of my teeth. I want to be part of Zion. I want to walk into life. I want to have everything that God Almighty has for me. Hallelujah. My time is slipping away quickly. Number two. Number two, make things right with God. That means get delivered. Get delivered of every demon, every power, every habit, everything that is unbecoming a child of God, everything that will separate between you and God. But there's another step. That's not the only step. That is a very important, irreducible step. But there's another step, and that second step is ask of God. Make things right with God, and then ask of God. Ask Him. Go ahead, ask Him. At reach out and ask God for the thing you're desiring. Luke, the 11th chapter, the 9th and the 10th verses. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and him that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh. What are you doing down at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp? Why aren't you out on the boat with a six-pack and a pound of pretzels? I'm in the house of God tonight because I'm still knocking. I'm still seeking. I'm still asking. And I'm asking specifically. Hallelujah. 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 The Holy Ghost will come through you. Somebody was saying today, and I agree with it. She was, Sister Trotter was saying, we mean it as a compliment. We don't mean it as a put-down. We mean it as a compliment. The atmosphere around here and the teaching around here, not the least bit strange. It's old-time Pentecost. It's what God ordained on the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago. Amen. It's been hidden so long, and it's gone. They all went off and left it. It sounds like something new. It ain't nothing. It isn't anything new. It's founded right four square on the word of Almighty God. Hallelujah! I'm glad we're part of what God's doing now. Amen. All right. So I agree. I agree. The Holy Ghost will come down and pray through you, and you won't even know what you're praying for. But you better be sensitive and obedient when the Holy Ghost prays through you. And if you can't think of anything else to pray for, and I'm not being cutesy now, I mean it. If you can't think of anything else to pray for, I want you to pray for me. I mean it. I want you to pray for me. I'm like a motherless, fatherless, sadly we roam. You know, cut off neither chick nor child. The door has been slammed. I mean, I'm starting all over again. But God, but I believe that. God's got a brand new door. But I need your prayers. I'm not... I'm not egotistical enough to think that I can go out and be a mount to a pinch of sand for Almighty God but without the undergirding of the prayers of the body of the, of the saints of believers. Amen! 
And so I'm very earnest. So I understand that. And if you can't pray for anything else, get down. Doc will tell you, get down and pray, oh, God save souls. And let the Holy Ghost come on you until you feel you're absolutely going to die of cramp colic. And let the power of God get a hold of you and pray for souls. So I believe that. But there is another little line under that I want to add. Brother Father wants to add it. And that is according to the will of God. According to the will of God, God's never going to give you the other guy's wife. They say, well, am I, I'm not interested in your past. I mean from tonight on. I'm not talking about bringing up old dead cats. I'm talking about now. Well, she doesn't understand me. Well, the next one won't either. You better stick with the one you got. Because she doesn't light my fire. Show me chapter and verse where she's got to. Hello? But he tracks his dirty, greasy shoes across my beautiful kitchen floor and my carpet. Let me tell you, we need to quit fiddle-foddling around with Hollywood and New York City and Tin Pan Alley and, uh, and the movies. Like the dear ladies that I'm not preaching against television tonight. Not preaching against it. And I look at more than Jimmy Swaggart and the news on television when I take a mind to. I'm under bondage to no man. But I'll tell you this. God Almighty wants us to quit getting our standards off of television, religious or otherwise, and get it from the Word of Almighty God and on our knees before God by the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And he can take that old bat you've been living with and make her like Gina Lola Brigida. That's right. God can make her look like the most desirable thing on the face of the earth to you. And that good-for-nothing lazy hunk you've been living with, he can cheat. God can turn him into Robert Wagner for you, whoever does. But I'm, let me tell you, we are not living on a sensual level. God, deliver us. Let's get our mind on Jesus. And get full of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And begin to pray specific prayers. Begin to pray specifically. And the Lord saves souls. You, that, that's a good prayer. I'm not making fun of that prayer. But you know, brother, I, can, I don't know why I'm preaching to you. I can preach to them. You're close enough. I need to give you a towel. <laughs> Praise God. But I... I uh, you see, we get on, oh, Lord saves souls. Well, if we hear of a revival in Brazil, we can say that's the answer to my prayer. The Lord saves souls. When we hear what God's doing up in the South Bronx, we can say that's an answer to my prayer. But if we say, God save my brother-in-law, John, ha ha, I wonder sometimes if we fail to ask specifically, because that gets our neck stretched out about 38 inches. And if John doesn't get saved, then it's very obvious that that particular prayer has not been answered. Much easier for me to say, God save souls, God save souls, and I pray that. But that's a much easier prayer, unless there is that specific heavy burden born of the Holy Ghost that will press you down. Do you think you're going to die? Do you get the victory and the anointing of the Holy Ghost to pray the thing through? But when I begin to pray, God save my brother-in-law, God save my grandson, God save my unsaved cousin, and you begin to pray, God save my boss, God save that reprobate that works on the machine lathe right next to me. Uh, my brother, sister, I want you to know when we begin to pray specifically, God Almighty is going to begin to answer specifically. I preach sometimes with R.W., he, he said a guy came up in his prayer line one time. You've heard him tell this. He tells the same thing for the last 20 years. guy came up in his prayer line, and because and, and, it really happened. And it happens over and over and over. He can say, what do you want the Lord to do for your brother? He said, I don't know, just anything he wants to. And so little Shambach looked at him and said, oh, God, kill him. Oh, I've got his attention. He said, brother, don't pray that. He said, well, you just pray whatever he wants to. He said, no, he said, I mean, I need to be healed. I've got arthritis or lumbago or heart trouble. He said, you mean you want to be healed? And so he lays hands on him and said, God, heal him of a heart trouble, heal him of the lumbago or heal him of the arthritis, or cast the devil out, do something to him. But this idea, we just, uh, we're just going to kind of go with the flow. If you can't fight, flee. If you can't flee, flow. And just going to go right on down the road uh, uh, with the enemy? No, sir! We're going to, brother, you don't know what you did for me. I, these services all run together, but it was you or somebody said, we need to quit playing around and buckle on the whole armor of God, and yes, you're saved by grace. 
Not a bigger, the, the biggest Baptist in Arkansas doesn't preach a grace any stronger than I do. But there is a warfare, and there is a buckling on of the whole armor of God. And having done all to stand, we stand therefore, and we wield the sword of the Spirit with the shield of faith, with the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness, and our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. My brother, sister, God's not looking for a bunch of joy riding vacationers. He's looking for men and women that'll get in the army of God and fight the good fight in the area of spiritual warfare. Hallelujah! I don't have to shout. But if I don't shout, I'm liable to burst and I'm too young to die. So, glory to God. Ask specifically. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and him that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Now, without the anointing of the Holy Ghost, prayer is hard work, and even with the anointing of the Holy Ghost, prayer is hard work. When my dad was smashed up in an airplane accident in 1949. A little Baptist that had been filled with the Holy Ghost, pastoring a little independent Baptist church south of Fort Worth. God woke her up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Her husband was saved, but he was a layman. He was not in the ministry, but he was a good man. And he was groggy, you know what? She said, I've got a terrible burden for A.N. Trotter. He said, why? She said, I don't know why. He said, over in Africa somewhere. She said, I don't know why. I said, I, I've got a terrible burden. He said, well, you better be right. And she got up and slipped into the guest bedroom, and she stayed, she said, doubled up on her bar in the fetal position by the side of the bed for hour after hour after hour. Until God Almighty released her of that burden. But she said, Brother Trotter, talking to me. She said, Brother Trotter, when I got done praying, I felt like a big man I had literally taken his fists and beaten my body. I was so stiff and I was so sore. I could hardly move. I took a hot shower and crawled into bed, totally exhausted. Even when the anointing of the Holy Ghost is on you, I'm not saying, well, just claim it by faith and take it by faith. And, and you're just going to say you got it and go home without it. Uh, and then you just go your merry way. My brother God did God will answer. We do command the forces of darkness. But there are some times we've got to get on our face before Almighty God and pray the thing through. Hallelujah. Now, I know some of the new preachers, and I understand what they're saying. And I'm not picking a fight. I'm not mad at anybody except the devil. This is the end of Part A. Please play Part B. Thank you. Our website is www. Lake Hamilton Bible Camp dot com and LHBC online dot com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you. For tapes of end time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory Declaring the Kingdom. Right, Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Saturday evening, May the 26th, 1990. Memorial Weekend uh, Teaching and Deliverance Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. A.R. Trotter is the Minister of the Evening. This is now the conclusion of this message from Part A of the Saturday Evening Service of May the 26th, 1990. Memorial Weekend Teaching and Deliverance Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Brother A.R. Trotter is the Minister of the Evening. Now, I know some of the new preachers, and I understand what they're saying. And I'm not taking a fight. I'm not mad at anybody except the devil. And they pray through what? Through, was it through what? A hole in the carpet? And I understand uh, that's a, you don't find that expression in the Word of God praying. But I know what I mean by that. I mean I wait on God until I get self and flesh and carnality under control and get in the proper relationship of Almighty God, and I get the thing from God that I desire. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! I know I'm too long. They like it. Turn around and look at them. They like it. <laughs> Glory to God. I'm getting signals. It's not from the Lord. It's from the woman that He gave to be with me. <laughs> but let me tell you something. It was right in the rainy season when His plane went down. 
And on the rainy season in West Africa, in equatorial West Africa, you can set your watch. Ten minutes after the sun comes up because of the prevailing sea breezes that come in over the jungles on the coastal countries, and because of where the sun is in the meridian, and where the sun is in the sky, it'll begin to rain. Fifteen, ten, fifteen minutes after daylight, it begins to rain until about eleven o'clock in the morning. And then because the sun is reaching its zenith or a, a, a coming near the zenith, it's burned off enough of the clouds, or for about one hour you'll have a little drizzle and an occasional dropping, but it basically is clear. And then shortly after noon, she closes back in as the sun begins to go down in the western horizon. It doesn't really go down. It stays still and the earth turns. But you understand what I mean. The sun goes down in the western horizon, and then the clouds come back in, and it'll rain until just about 6 o'clock in the evening, and then it will clear up, and all night long there might be an occasional little light shower or a little drizzling and dripping. But basically in the night, even sometimes, it'll clear up, and you can see this moon and the stars at night, even in the height of the rainy season. And for about three and a half or four months, it's just like clockwork. You set your watch by the time. It absolutely follows an inviolable, inexorable, physiological, geological, meteorological cycle. You didn't know what I knew, all those big words. I just wanted to impress you a little bit. <laughs> Twelve o'clock noon came. My father, they, the plane was overloaded. They held down the tail of it on a bush airstrip. Bush plane. Held down the tail of it, revved up the motors, taxied down. The grass was about two feet high. They taxied down that little bumpy airstrip. The guy saw that he could, it was past the point of shutting her down. He'd have gone right into the trees. And so he pulled in the flaps and mushed into the air at about 55 or 60 miles an hour. With that load, takeoff speed should have been about 80 or 85. And he mushed into the air where there was a hill about 1,000 feet high that he had to get over. So at about 1,000, 1,200 feet, he dumped his flaps to get enough speed to try to get over the hill. And when he did, he went into a power spin. And he hit the ground at about 300 knots airspeed. My dad's seat belt didn't break. He was riding in the co-pilot seat, you know, side by side. Co-pilot seat, his seat belt didn't break, but the two steel rods that held the seat snapped like a matchstick and smashed him down into the dashboard of the plane. I was the first white man to reach his side. Several of the Christian Africans were with me, black Africans were with me, and we ran. It was by the time the plane got us over a mile away through dense jungle, no road, no path. Cut your way with a machete. Got over there, they were on the edge of a stream. My dad was, his nose was torn off, laying by just a little piece of skin underneath his right eye. His left cheekbone was smashed in where you could double up your fist and lay it in the hollow of his cheek. His jaw was both broken in two places, and there were two transverse cracks through the cribiform plate of his brain. And we later found out in New York City that the Christigalli bone, which separates, separates the two frontal lobes of the brain, was completely smashed, gone. He lost all of his cerebral fluid. He was bleeding from his eyes, of course, and what was left of his nose through the open septum, and he was, he was bleeding through, uh, through his ears and his mouth. Couldn't He was conscious. I said, Daddy, you kind of nodded his head. I got him on a makeshift stretcher, had a couple of the Africans help me, and we carried him over a mile through the jungle back to the mission house. We gathered. Ner I was nervous. I was a kid. We gathered nervous, nervous and excitable, didn't know what to do, put him on a bed. He called for me, Alfred. I had, my brother and I had been holding revival meetings back in French country. Dad had been holding a seminar for the preachers. Mother had been off some other place preaching. We were gathering together to go down to what was then the Congo, to what now is Kinshasa, in, uh, in Zare. And we were then the Belgian Congo. We were getting ready to go down to Leopoldville and hold a big crusade. We'd all been scattered out, but we'd gathered together after months to hold meetings together and work our way down to the Republic of South Africa, the Union of South Africa then. So, make a long story longer, we put him in there. He said, Alfred, he couldn't talk. I'm, I'm yelling. He whispered it. I ran in. I said, what is it, Dad? He said, my feet itch. Terrible. He had been vomiting up basins of blood. The human body, he was a large man. The human body only holds, what, nine pints, ten pints? Doc, what, eleven pints if you're a real big man? Twelve pints? Doesn't hold much more than that. And he literally a little wash basin... Basin after basin after basin. He was not hurt in his abdomen. It was all from his head and his thorax smashed up, going down into his stomach, gathering there, making him nauseated, and he was bringing it up. And I told my brother, 
I said, look, Dad can't live long. No way to give him a transfusion. Nothing what to do back there. I didn't know what to do. Pack him. There's no ice. Pack him with some cotton in the, in the open, you know, Halloween pumpkin opening of a nose in the front of his skull. Try to stop the bleeding. Didn't know what to do. And he kept bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. And they fixed the dinner. And said, Brother Trotter, you better come and eat. So my brother and I went out to eat, and there was a, a, a missionary registered nurse that was there on that particular mission station, mission house. They said, go get her and have her, Sister Johansson, or Sister, yeah, Johansson, said, go get Norma Johansson and, and tell her that she better come out and eat. So I went back down the hall of the house, knocked on the door, and said, Norma, they want you to come and eat. She said, go away, leave me alone. Well, it was totally out of character for her. And I didn't know what in the world was wrong. So I went back out down to the table, and two or three minutes later, one of the Pa Norval or somebody else said, Well, is Norma coming? I said, Oh, she must not have understood. And I went back down the hall again and knocked on the door. She said, Get away and leave me alone. I said, Norma, they sent me down here. This isn't my idea. They, she said, Don't you know that if they don't send another plane back for your father, he'll never live? And I said, yeah, I know we're trying to get word through now. She said, don't you know, when the clouds close back in, they'll never be able to find this little bush airstrip back here like a needle in a haystack. Even when it's clear, they'll never get back in. She said, I'm praying, oh, God, don't let it rain. 1.30, she's back there praying, God, don't let it rain. God, don't let it rain. God, don't let it rain. And 2 o'clock, God, don't let it rain. 3 o'clock, God, don't let it rain. 4 o'clock, God, don't let it rain. 5 o'clock, God, don't let it rain. Five minutes after five, I heard the drone of the motor. And here comes another little speed to light plane flying back and sets down. We carry Dad out, stuff him in the cockpit. And I asked Brother uh, Walter Gunther, who was piloting the plane, I, I said, Brother, Gunther, I said, whatever gave you nerve? He said, we've debated all afternoon. We knew when the other plane didn't come that something was wrong, but we said we'll never find the airstrip, and I didn't have enough gas to get back there and back down to the coast. But he said, after a while, I couldn't stand it anymore. He said, Trotter, you'll not believe this. But he said, when I took off and I circled to gain altitude, he said, there is a corridor from Plebo back here to Jedipo. It is three quarters of a mile wide, and it ends just a half a mile the other side of the airstrip. Brother, we, they took off, and as he disappeared toward the coast, the clouds closed in, and it rained all night. Don't you tell me that a little Baptist woman full of the Holy Ghost praying until she felt like her body had been beaten with this, and that little uh, Pentecostal nurse praying, God, don't let it rain. Don't tell me that my God doesn't hear an answer prayer. He's still alive, and he still hears an answer's prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah, he lived on enough. That was 1949. He just went home to glory in 82. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Sure he lived. Oh, all kinds of... God did all kinds of miracles in that thing. But anyway, he raised him up, and he went back to Africa about five more times. Most of the Pentecostal preachers in Nigeria right now that have the baptism testify to the fact they got the baptism under the ministry of A.N. Trotter. Dad had a marvelous, powerful ministry. That's why the devil was trying to kill him. That's why the devil was trying to kill him. But God said, I'm going to answer the prayer of those two handmaidens of mine. <laughs> ah, hallelujah. Ask specifically, and it shall be done unto you. Oh, I can't go ahead and tell them the rest of that, honey. I can't. No, I can't. Well, I tell you what, he died. They got him down to the Firestone Rubber Plantation Hospital at, at Cape Thomas. And I'll hurry it up. Really, I know you're getting numb, but that's, that's all right. He says, stand up and turn around quietly and sit back down again. Glory to God. I like that. I'm going to use that all over America. Glory to Jesus. <laughs> and there was a Danish doctor with a little Australian nurse wife running the little rub, rubber plantation hospital, Firestone Rubber Plantation Hospital. And he worked on him, tried to get whole blood, tried to get plasma, tried to get saline solution in him. He was completely dehydrated. He had bleeding to death. Besides the horrible trauma of the, of the injuries he'd sustained to the head, he'd, he lost all his blood. His heart was strong, but there was nothing there for it to beat. And it's shortly after 6 o'clock, four or five minutes after 6 o'clock, he pronounced him dead and pulled the sheet up over his head and said, I'll come and help you bury him in the morning. And Sister Dietta Butler from over here in Kilgore, Texas, 
Sister Dietta Butler sat by my dad's bedside that night in that hospital, that little rubber plantation hospital, hanging on to his wrist out from underneath the sheet pulled up over his head and said, God, we're not going to give him up. God, we're not going to give him up. You sent him over here to preach, and this is not your time or your way or your will. This is the power of hell and darkness, and we are not going to give him up. And at eight minutes past twelve midnight, because she wrote it down in, in, in Cape Thomas at the Rubber Plantation Hospital, she said she felt a pulse. Where for four hours before there was no pulse. They'd even like they did on the battlefield, taking the plastic bags and tried to squeeze the fluid, you know, in the bottom of his foot, in the top of his foot, in the groin area, all over his body. They could not get his, his veins and arteries had collapsed because he had completely bled to death. No blood left. And she felt a pulse, and she said, you know, you can hang on to a doorknob for four hours, and you'll begin to feel the beating of your own heart. You know, thum, 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 thum. Said, I'm, I'm hallucinating. So she called out. She said, nurse! And the doctor's little Australian wife got up and came padding in in her nightgown and her slippers and said, yes, dearie, what, what is it? And said, I think I feel a pulse. She said, impossible. But reflex action for a registered nurse. She absolutely, you know, casually reached over, took his wrist, and put her fingers on his pulse, and she let out a blood-curdling yell, and here comes the Danish doctor in his bare feet and his pajama bottoms. He comes running in. What is it? She said, I think I feel a pulse. He said, you're crazy. You can't feel a pulse. He's dead. But he reached over, and then, I mean, he immediately, for four hours before, they could not get Dad to take any whole blood or plasma or saline solution. They gave him ten units of blood, and he kept it in, and God didn't take him home. Doctor x-rayed him, and he said, something must be wrong with my x-ray equipment. And he x-rayed him again. He said, I, he called me. By this time, that was another miracle, how I got down to the coast. But anyway, right in the rainy season, with the speed the light airplane all smashed up. But anyway, I got down to the coast. He called me in and said, look, son. He said, your dad is in very bad shape. He's got two cracks through the cribiform plate. His skull is now in three pieces. And said, if, if one of those cracks opens up and blood gets back in there, it's curtains. I've got to send him back to Columbia Medical Center, Presbyterian Hospital in New York City, and I want you to go along with him because I don't think he can stand the trip, and you're to dispose of the body. You know, that was pleasant. So we got him back to New York City. They had one of the leading rhinologists from Washington, D.C. come up, and the guy that had installed the x-ray machines took them, and they rewrote that particular Dr. Wool, William Hall Holden, Dr. William Hall Holden, was the chief surgeon, and he wrote an extra little paragraph that this man had sustained head injuries that should have killed him at the moment of impact. They teach British commandos to kill a man by hitting him on the bridge of the nose and driving that bone back into the brain. It's instant death. He said, man, you should have died at moment of impact. They operated. I said, how long do you think the operation will be? They said, man, we're going to have to take a whole series of operations. Lift that cheekbone out very carefully. They had Dr. Woodard had to take his eye out and reattach the, the muscles and the nerves and do little fine embroidery stitches around there to, he, because he was cross-eyed. He couldn't see. His whole left eye was smashed in. His nose, they had to rebuild him a nose, plastic surgery. They worked and they said, it'll be a series of operations. We're going to have to be so careful. They gave him a local and did it all in six hours, from noon till six o'clock one day. Dad had heard all his life. He'd heard all his life that, you know, if you've ever were unsaved uh, before you got saved and you used bad language, you get under anesthesia, you're liable to use bad language. And he asked me to pray for him. He said, son, pray for me. I don't want to ruin my testimony. Help me. Help me to just, oh, God, help me. The first thing he asked the doctor when he came out of recovery room, he said, what did I say? What did I say? They said, we want to know what this baptism of the Holy Ghost and talking in tongues is all about. He said, you kept preaching to us the whole time, saying you need to get rid of your sin and get washed in the blood uh, and get the baptism of the Holy Ghost and talk in tongues. <laughs> Hallelujah! Blessed be the name of our God forever. Thank you, Jesus. Pray specifically. You say, well, Brother Trotter, before God and the angels, and we've not been having little games here. We've been doing business for God. And I believe that some of you, as you're as honest before God as you know how to be, you've confessed everything that you... You confessed the sins of your ancestors back ten generations. 
Man, you've gone back. You've confessed everything. You know how to confess. You've cast every demon out that you know how to I'm not being sarcastic. I mean it. You're here to get something from God. You didn't come down for a joyride. You're here to get something from God, and you've done everything you know how to pray specifically. Man, you've got it out in quintuplicate with photocopies. I mean, in case God forgets, you've absolutely asked Him as specifically as you know how. What is the third step? I'll tell you. It sounds like the hardest, and it's really the easiest. There comes a time after you have made things right with God, and after you have asked as specifically as you know how, according to the will of God and according to the Word of God, then you reach out by faith and you reach receive the thing. Well, is that it? Yeah, that's it. You receive it. For we have this confidence in God that if we ask anything of Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hear us. And if we know that He hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire. Not maybe, seemingly, perhaps it might be some other way. We have the petition that we desire. I said we have the petition that we desired if we ask according to the will of Almighty God. Amen. Amen. I mean, whatever it is. Old H.B. Garlock was in Bible college. They didn't call it Bible college back then because they didn't think you had to have a degree to preach the Word of God. They thought if you were full of the Holy Ghost and got some good rudiments of the Word of God and grabbed your Bible and went out by the power of the Holy Ghost, you could see things done for Jesus. But now we've gotten more educated and sophisticated, and we realize that really you need a, at least a Ph.D., if not a D.D. Oh, Paul was a D.D. You know that. He was coming along with his wheelbarrow, and somebody said, Hey, Paul, where you, what you got there? Where are you going? He said, Well, what I've got? They said, Yeah, let me look at it. He said, Well, you have all of your university degrees. Man, you've got all your stocks and bonds. You've got all your lineage. You've got all of your genealogy. You've got all of these awards from the Elks and the Beavers and the Daughters of the Eastern Star. And I mean, you, you've got it all. What do you go? What are you doing with it? He said, I'm going out in back of the barn. Hey, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to dig a new map, a hole in the manure pile, and I'm going to stuff it in. For I count all things but loss, that I might come to the excellency of the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus. Paul was a D.D., dung hole digger. Glory to God and the Lamb forever. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. O.H.B. Garlock was in missionary training school at Old Beulah Heights. And they had a revival in the school. Don't have too many of those anymore, but back then, they used to have revivals in the school. Power of God fall like rain, and his roommate's girlfriend got the baptism. And his roommate's name was Clyde. And Clyde was grousing around the dining hall. Oh, I don't see why the Lord filled Eleanor, and the Lord didn't fill me. And the Lord must not love me. I've been seeking for ten years. I've been seeking the baptism for ten years, and I haven't got it yet. After a while, Garlock got tired of him and said, Clyde, if you'd quit your lying and confess to God that you're a lion, then maybe God would fill you. Brother Garlock! Get out on Brother Garlock, me. How was I lying? So said, how are you lying? You've been telling everybody you've been seeking the baptism ten years. I thought I heard you telling the fellows the other day you'd been down to the Danbury State Fair. What was you doing down there, seeking the baptism? He said, I thought you were down to the ice cream place flirting with a girl in back of the counter at the soda counter. What was you doing, seeking the baptism? You're sitting up the other night playing a game with some of the kids down in the recreation hall. What were you doing, seeking the baptism? No, I was just being normal. I said, well, don't go around lying and telling everybody you've been seeking the baptism ten years. Take all the time put together. It wouldn't be four hours. What are you talking about, seeking the baptism ten years? I'm not seeking the baptism ten years. They went to bed. They had bunk beds. Second floor. It was a faith Bible school, and they didn't have much faith because they were very cold in the wintertime. They had to shut the heat off at night. And they crawled into the covers... After about ten minutes, Uncle Henry said he felt the bed begin to shake. 
A few minutes later, Clyde said, Henry. Yeah, what is it, Clyde? If you'll get out of bed and pray with me, I'll ask the Lord to forgive me for lying. <laughs> then Garlock wished he'd kept his mouth shut because there was about ten above zero. <laughs> and they got out on that cold, bare floor, and they got down and began to pray. And old Clyde hadn't begun to confess his sin and ask God to forgive him for lying and putting up a big show and a pretense. In about ten minutes' time, bang! power of God hit him and his head hit the floor. His mouth flew open and he came through talking in a language that he had never learn. Woke the whole floor up. They come running down to the room and said, what's going on? And there was 13 more at the baptism of the Holy Ghost in that man's room that night. Say, Brother Trotter, how can you be so sure? Because my dad was in school at the same time and he roomed directly under Clyde and Henry. And when Clyde's head hit the floor, the old gas mantles they had in the gas fixtures, they cost three for a dime. And it was like a Coleman gas mantle. You know, you can burn them, but once they are burnt, they turn to ash. And any little jiggle bursts them. And then you've got to use new ones. And when Clyde's head hit the floor, it burst all three of Dad's mantles. And he got up and went upstairs and said, Who started this? They said, Oh, it's wonderful. Clyde got it first. He went over to Clyde's pants, picked them off the chair, fished in the pocket, and got a dime for his mantles. <laughs> ah, hallelujah! Receive the thing. There comes a time that God Almighty gets tired of you playing games. It's time to be stand on the Word of God and receive what God has for you. I'm not talking about taking by faith, saying you got it, and going home without it. I'm talking about reaching out and laying hold of the hem of His garment until the divine virtue of the Son of God is released and you are liberated for the power and the glory of God. Amen! Oh, I talked too long. God, help me. Because I feel that God wants to do something for us tonight. God wants to do something for us tonight. God wants to do something for us tonight. Receive the thing. Receive the thing. Quit let the devil bully rag you. Oh, Brother Trotter, I, I'm not satisfied with my experience. Is there something wrong with me? There may be. But when you're under the blood and you are delivered and you are set free and every devil of hell has been cast out of you and commanded to go, and you know that you're not playing games... To the absolute best of your ability, you're honest to God and you scrape down and you're praying before Almighty God. Quit trying to impress the preacher. Quit trying to impress Brother Miller. Quit trying to impress Jack Harris or anybody else. You get your mind right on God. We're not trying to impress people. We're trying to press through to the kingdom and begin to inherit the city that God has built for His children. Amen. Glory to God. Now, I understand because I've got ears like a Missouri mule, you know. And so I, I picked up. So if you differ, differ with me on this, don't you get mad at me. You just pray the Lord will help me. But I had no choice when it came to women preachers because my mother was an ordained Pentecostal preacher before I was ever conceived. I had no choice in the matter whatsoever. And she, she was a woman of God. She was a prophetess. She was a woman of God. Marvelously used of God. She and her brother Henry opened up cannibal country all through West Africa. I mean, places where they ate their dead ceremonially. Not for the Africans never practiced cannibalism for hunger. It wasn't like Alfred Packer up on Donner Pass in California where they ate to survive. All African cannibalism has always been as a religious ceremony. They opened up cannibal country when I was back there in the late 40s with my mother in a particular place. And they said, are you really the lady that came with her brother many years ago? My mother said, I'm the one. said, here, we must quick show you something. They said, if that woman ever comes back, we want you to show her something. And they took us out to the edge of town. And there were two headstones, the two first funeral cemetery plots in that entire part of the country. For they said, if that woman ever comes back, you tell her that we go to join her in God's fine country. <laughs> ah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. My brother, sister, dear, my mother was a woman of God. When I got up into college, and it doesn't, I don't talk like I was exposed to very much of it, but actually I had a few hours. And... Uh, Mother preached some revival meetings. Now, if you don't believe me, call it what you want. She testified then. Actually, she preached. She was a good preacher. But she went out to West Texas to hold some revival meetings. And God, there are missionaries on the foreign field today that got saved and got the baptism under her ministry. I don't have to defend it. You don't believe in it. You aren't going to believe in it because I give a little five minutes spit. And if you do believe in them, I'm already preaching to the choir. So, all right. 
But she got on a bus. They didn't have plane service, and they didn't have train service. They had bus service from Muskogee, Oklahoma, out to Border, Texas. And there was a lady got on in Oklahoma City and sat down alongside of her. She weighed about 90 pounds. She was about five foot three or four. Had a little black dress on, a little black pillbox hat, a little black veil. Had a little bandage here on the side of her neck. Sat down on the bus alongside of my mother. And mother, not trying to be super holy, but because she was a woman of God, got out her little Bible and began to read it. And this woman viciously turned on my mother and said, I wish you'd put that thing up. Oh, mother was so wise. She didn't rise to the bait. She just put the fold of the Bible, put it in her great big... Now, all preacher women got to have great big black purses. Mother had one. And she stuffed her purse, stuffed the Bible in her big black preacher woman's purse, and just sat there for a few minutes. And after a few minutes, she turned to her, laid her hand on the little, you know, bus seats are real close together, laid it on the lady's arm and said, My dear, you've been terribly hurt. Would you like to tell me about it? And the woman broke down and began to cry and said, How do you know? She said, why, for me just to be innocently sitting here reading my Bible and for you to have that reaction tells me that you've been terribly hurt. And she said, I'm returning from Rochester, Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic. And this bandage on my neck, it started out a few months ago what I thought was just like a little pimple. And it got worse and worse and worse. And I went to my family physician, and he sent me to Amarillo. And then from Amarillo, they sent me up to Rochester, and they tell me that it started out as a skin cancer, and it has developed into, actually it was on the side of her face, it, actually, it has developed into an internal cancer. It is spread under the surface and through, and it is now through the whole right upper side of my brain. And said it's already beginning to affect the vision of my left eye because, you know, the occipital nerves cross. And said it's beginning, I'm not, I can still use my left hand, but if I pick up something just a little heavier than it can handle, it'll drop out of my hand. I'm beginning to drag my left leg just a little bit, but it is rapidly metastasizing. Now, there have been great advances since this, but at that time, they could not radioactive gold, radioactive mustard, some very primitive chemotherapy, or some very primitive radiation treatment. They said, we'll cook your brain. You'll be nothing but a vegetable when we get done. They couldn't pinpoint it like they can now. And so they have sent me home to die, saying there's no treatment except topical painkiller for this ulcerated, burning thing on the side of her face. And she said, I just don't understand why me and why I've tried to be a good mother and a good wife, and and why me? And so mother began to talk to her about the Lord. She said, oh, I was saved as a girl in the Methodist church. She said, I was married in the Methodist church, but I've never been back because my husband Jack is a good man, works for Cosden Oil, petrochemical company, and has a good position, but he has no time for God or the church, but he's a good provider and a good husband and doesn't run around on me, and I've just never been back to church. She was about 54 years of age. And she said, I'm dying, and that's why I lashed out at you that way. And my mother said, I can't tell you the story, but how my grandfather was completely, absolutely, wholly delivered from tobacco and alcohol and strychnine and morphine, saved three nights later filled with the Holy Ghost, and God delivered him and completely liberated him of the power of the Holy Ghost, told her the story and said, I'm going to be preaching at such and such a church. Why don't you come out and hear me? She said, oh, I can't, because my husband will never allow me to. said, I, they had some kind of a meeting a few years ago, and I said I wanted to go to hear some singers or something. He said, if you've got to get religion, get sensible religion, don't hang around those holy rollers. So he said, I know that he'll never allow me to come. So mother said, well, dear, I'll be praying for you. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, after she had already taken the pulpit and began to preach. Mother was not long-winded like me. Twenty-five minutes, she was done. Make the altar call, minister to the people. And uh, right into her sermon, the door opens, big crowd, five, six hundred there in the church that night, four hundred. I wasn't there, but it was a full house. And, And this lady comes in, sits down in the back. Mother makes the altar call, first one up out of her seat, and she wore a slight limp. She wasn't horribly crippled yet. But a slight limp came down the aisle and stood right here. Didn't know what else to do. Didn't know to get on her knees. Dry-eyed. No tears. No convulsions. No shaking. No great cryings or groanings. Just stood there, a little petite 54-year-old Methodist lady with the same black suit, black hat, black veil, standing there. So they went down to deal with her and said, yes, what she said, well, I'd like to get what that woman told me about on the bus and what she's been talking about tonight. I'd like to get right with God. 
So said, would you like to kneel? Oh, all right. So she got down and knelt. They prayed with her. Well, old time Pentecost for all their services, 30 minutes, we all thought we were backslidden. I mean, you know, you stayed there for an hour, and they got up, and uh, so uh, when it was time to go, half the congregation had already left, the other half up around the front rejoicing, several had come to the Lord that night, and this lady said, I would like to testify. And she told them the story that I just told you. And so she said, my, my husband Jack was at a special meeting down at the plant, and so I got a taxi and came out of the service, and I'm so glad I did, and they all clapped and praised the Lord and, and had a big time. And then the, the pastor got up and said, now we're going to dismiss in prayer. And she said, wait just a minute. She said, this lady told me something about the baptism of the Holy Ghost and talking in tongues. Can I get that? They said, oh, yes, dear. And Mother said, I'm going to be preaching on that on Saturday night. Why don't you come back? She said, my husband Jack may not allow me to come back on Saturday night. I'd like to get it tonight. How do you get it? Well, by this time, more people had left. There's just maybe 35, 40 people left up around the front. Later, so mother came down off the platform, quickly gave her Acts 2, 4, 10, 46 in the 19th chapter, and a few little pertinent thoughts out of uh, 1 Corinthians 12, and said, well, all you have to do is just raise your hands and ask God to fill you, and He will. And the poor soul had not been around us enough to know that you've got to agonize and roll on the floor. She thought all you had to do was raise your hands, ask God to fill you, and you're dead. So she stands there with her eyes wide open. Don't even think she closed them. Just let's stand there. Oh, Jesus, I thank you for saving me. Will you fill me with the Holy Ghost? Bang! She began to talk in tongues, standing right there. Some of the people kind of looked at her, you know, it didn't, didn't look too authentic to her then. She hadn't gone through the proper Church of God gyrations. But anyway, uh, or whatever, if you're from the Church of God, don't you be mad at me. You know what I'm talking about, though. And, and so uh, she rejoiced in the Lord and talked in tongues. And, uh, in fact, she did a little pirouette. She was dragging her left leg a little bit, but, you know, a dainty little lady doing a little dance across the front and, and came back over and did a little dance, and they were all shouting, Oh, glory, glory, glory! And then they said, Now we'll be dismissed. Now there's about 15 people. And everybody's going, Oh, it's midnight. I said, there's 15 people standing there. She said, Now I would like to be healed. They told me about how God healed her father. I'd, mother said, that's fine. Sunday night, I'm having a healing line. She said, Jack, may not let me come back on Sunday night. Uh, I'd like to get healed now. So they gave her a few scriptures, came down. Back in the old days, we thought we had to anoint him with oil, and we gave him a good liberal dose of, uh, of uh, some Italian imported olive oil, uh, and, you know, gave him a good Pentecostal Dutch rub and shook him good, uh, and, uh, and I prayed for him, and, oh, God rebuked that cancer in the name of Jesus, and nothing happened. Nothing. But she testified, said, I want to thank Jesus for saving me, filling me with the Holy Ghost, and healing my body. So they all praised the Lord, and then she said, you know, when the anointing lifted, she said, I'm kind of afraid to go home and face Jack. Kind of afraid to go home and face Jack. Mother said, I'm not afraid of man or beast, and got the pastor's wife, who was rather a large lady, that any professional wrestler in his right mind wouldn't have attacked her. And, and so she said, we'll go with you. So they were talking in tongues and praying. Borders a little town. There was only 35,000 back then, or 30,000, and it's gone down since the oil patch went down. But uh, it was just a small town, not a big town, big city. And so they, they went over across town, pulled up, and she said, well, I think I got nerve enough to go in by myself. And she went in. The lights were all out. She said, that's good. He's asleep. Cars in the driveway. He's asleep. And so she went in, and she tiptoed across the floor, turned on the light briefly in the kitchen, saw 12 empty beer cans. I've never been a drinking man, but I understand that's a half-decent load. And he, he, picked, he, he, he knocked down two six-packs, and up the stairs she went, went into bed, and he groaned and rolled over and said, is that you? She said, yes, dear. He said, where have you been? Well, she wasn't going to lie. She said, I went down, and she called the name of the church. And he said, what happened? What did you do? She said, oh, dear Jack, it's wonderful. I'm saved, and I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and I talk in tongues, and I'm healed. I'm not going to die. Now, he didn't, he didn't tell her at the time. He told me later. He said the doctor had told him that that thing would get progressively worse until she lost her mind. And he thought, oh, my God, it's happened. <laughs> That's the truth. I knew them well. Next morning, he wakes up. He's got a head as big as a wash tub, and his mouth feels like his stomach's been taken in washings. You know, I mean, he, he is in sad shape. Uh, but she's down brewing the coffee and fixing the breakfast and just rejoicing in the Lord. She's still got the bandage on the side of her head. 
But that didn't make any difference. Man, she went down to do the shopping that day, told the girl at the checkout counter at the LB market all about how she'd been down to the Holy Roller Ark. They called it Noah's Ark because it was a big old hay barn looking kind of a building with windows along the side. Up along the higher rise, you've seen them through the years. And so said, I've been down to that church and I got Satan, got the baptism of the Holy Ghost and God healed me and I'm not going to die. And they looked at her like a cow staring at a new gate, you know. Went to the drugstore, told them the same thing. Went to the beauty parlor, told them the same thing. Came back to church on Friday night. Jack said, you go over my dead body. She said, how many hymns do you want at the funeral? <laughs> oh, and she got in the taxi and came back to church. <laughs> Wanted to testify. You don't have to beg them when they really got the real thing. Amen? God took that little timid girl, filled her. She's 54 years old, but she was so small. Filled her with the Holy Ghost. She jumped up, wanted to testify. Said, oh, I thank God I'm saved. Filled the Holy Ghost and God healed me. Everybody shouted. Saturday night she came back. She wanted to testify again. She got up and testified again. Half the people shouted. She got up and testified again. On Sunday morning, nobody shouted. She came back Sunday night and she testified again. And they were... <sighs> You see, she was going on. Now, that wasn't a big city. You get by with that in Dallas. But Borger, everybody knew her. I mean, everybody was good Masonic brethren with Jack. Everybody knew Mrs. Collins. See, everybody knew her. They all knew poor Mrs. Collins dying of cancer. I mean, they all knew it. Little town. I mean, you sneeze, and the whole city says, God bless you. You know, I mean, it's, it's a little town. And what was happening, the people of the church said, she's bringing reproach. On our church, we got a hard enough time. They call us names now. And she's going around telling everybody she's healed, and she's not healed. So on Monday night, some of the elders came to the pastor and said, Look, why don't you talk to that woman and tell her we're glad that she's saved and got the baptism and that we prayed for her, but until she's really healed, don't go around testifying that she's healed. Well, the pastor wasn't dumb. He waited till my mother got there, and he said, Sister Trotter, you know you're a convert? <laughs> my mother was a gracious woman. Back in those days, when they fixed people's teeth in the front, they would frequently put gold teeth. And mother had a beautiful golden scissor on one side and one on the other side. When she smiled, it looked like a Zales hardware store, I mean, a Zales jewelry counter. Gracious woman, full of the Spirit of God. And so she went up to her and said, Dear, flash that famous smile at her, said, Dear, yes. Said, oh, we're just so rejoicing in what God has done for you. He saved you and filled you with a wonderful Holy Spirit, and you speak in tongues, and, and oh, it's marvelous. But don't you just think it might be a little better if you don't testify to your healing uh, until you're really healed? And she said, Why, Sister Trotter... I am really healed. What would make you say a thing like that? Well, Mother was gracious, but she said, Well, after all, dear, the bandage is still there, and the cancer is still there. Oh, Sister Collins said, Is that all that's bothering you? Why, I thought you'd understand that. You said if we ask anything in His name, believing that we should receive it, that we should have it of Him. said, you all prayed for me. I ask Him. I believe it. And I've already received it. Mother said, well, all right. What's the thing doing there? She said, why, Sister Trotter, I'm healed. The devil just hasn't taken down his sign yet. Ah, <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah! You're way ahead of me. I can see some of you grinning and nodding your head. She went home from church on that Monday night. And like most 50, not you, not after that lesson we had from her, but most of you, before you heard her lesson, you're in the bathroom putting on queen bee jelly and mud packs and Helena Rubenstein and, and Merle Norman and what the rest, trying to get rid of the wrinkles and the crow's feet and what have you. And Sister Collins was no different. She was in there and she was fixing herself up for the night. A pound and a half of grease on her face. You know, I mean, she, she was there getting all uh, oil of ole and, and all that goody stuff and... and what she would do, the doctor had given her some topical painkiller. That thing would itch and burn, and it was just so bad. And so what she would do is just take the bandage off, and it was repulsive to look at. 
But she'd take the bandage off in the privacy of her bathroom and take a wet washcloth, wring it out, fold it up in the pad, and hold it up to the side of her face. And she'd do that two or three times because it kind of eased the pain and the soothing. Then she'd take this benzocaine or whatever he gave her and, and smear it on the outside, kind of deaden the pain, put a fresh bandage on, and go to bed. She was gradually getting worse. Her arm just even since she was prayed for. And so this night she's there thanking the Lord for the great service, and Jack is mad as hornets in the other room pretending to be asleep. And she's there, she's got the thing up, and she wrings the washcloth out, folds it in a pad, puts it up the side of her face and pulls it down, and that cancer drops off in the washcloth. She lets out a scream, my face, my face, my face! Jack comes barreling out of bed in his pajamas and said, what is it? She said, my face. He was scared she was dying on the spot. He grabs her up in his arms. She only weighed about 90 pounds or so. Grabs her up in his arms, grabs the keys off the dresser, and in his pajamas goes tearing down the stairs out into the car, and he's driving across Burger 1230 at night. The tape of the last 12 minutes of this service was blank, for which I have no explanation. However, the conclusion of this incident that Brother Trotter is relating was that when they arrived at the doctor's office, they found that she was gloriously healed, which consequently brought Jack to, uh, to, his, to salvation and to a glorious infilling of the Holy Spirit. The Lord liveth, the Lord liveth, blessed be the name of the Lord.
website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.